back. Next up is a broad 30,000 foot view of the key concepts related to water quality in Idaho. We will explore the Clean Water Act, a federal pollution control legal framework, the concept of beneficial uses, the two types of pollution sources, and the common pollutants found in Idaho waterways. Ready to go? The Clean Water Act was passed in 1972. Now, can anybody recognize this photo here? Were you around when that photo was taken? This photo is of the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio, and it's on fire. That's right, the river caught fire in 1968 because it was laden with oils and other petroleum products. The photos made the front page of Time Magazine in the summer of 1968, and it helped prompt a burgeoning environmental movement to push for water quality protection legislation. Now, there's two interesting things about this photograph. First of all, this photo was actually taken during the 1954 Cuyahoga River fire. Nobody had taken good photos of the 1968 fire, so Time Magazine had to resort to using stock footage of the earlier fire. You see, the Cuyahoga River had caught on fire more than once a decade since 1868. That's at least 13 times. The other thing was, while the Cuyahoga River got all the news coverage, three other rivers caught fire that year. The Chicago, the Buffalo, and Michigan's Rogue River. Horrible pollution was a common theme in waterways through the cities before the Clean Water Act was passed. Nobody went down to the river to recreate or fish. We as a society had turned our backs to the nation's waterways since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It was the Clean Water Act and other legislation passed during the late 1960s and early 1970s that led to better protection of our natural life support systems, sometimes referred to by academics as ecosystem services. The Clean Water Act has a strong foundation and was built on existing precedent of a series of Clean Water Acts that began in 1948, right after World War II. Those earlier versions, though, had no regulatory teeth and were primarily a research funding mechanism. Research centers were established where scientists started studying the growing problem of heavily polluted rivers. With each research project, it became increasingly clear that the pollution itself and also the various sources of pollution were very complex. That rivers flowed through multiple jurisdictions, including multiple states, meant that state-by-state -state regulations were ineffective. These funded research programs got a lot done, though, and they built a substantial case for developing a strong national policy for clean water regulations. The Clean Water Act was the first to develop both water quality criteria and a mechanism for enforcing those criteria. It also provided a significant funding stream to solve the majority of the point source pollution from industry and wastewater treatment plants. The act was built over four years with bipartisan support and included some compromises that helped it to pass. It passed, in fact, with an overwhelming bipartisan majority in both the House and the Senate. Nixon, President Nixon, however, had other ideas for developing administrative rules to protect water quality. His rules would have been good, but would not have had the teeth that the Clean Water Act did. Nixon vetoed the new act, sending it back to Congress. Congress then, again, with an overwhelming bipartisan vote, overrode Nixon's veto, and it became law in fall of 1972. The Clean Water Act has had four significant overhauls in 1977, 1981, 1987, and 2014. The 1987 amendments were particularly important for expanding funding for non-point source or stormwater pollution. We'll get into that in more detail shortly. While we are on the subject of the Clean Water Act, it's important to understand two particular precedents it's built on. First and foremost is the 1898 Rivers and Harbors Act. As the Industrial Revolution was gaining momentum, major shipping ports were experiencing problems with debris jams. It was common practice to simply toss anything to be discarded into the river or bay. 
household trash in the day was one thing. But think about all of the old buildings and used lumber, even dead livestock like horses and oxen were simply dumped into the water. More and more docks and platforms were being built into the nation's rivers and harbors too, creating increasing obstacles for ship captains. The concentration of wastes, especially large-sized waste materials, were causing a severe impediment to shipping traffic and dangerous conditions for ships trying to make their way to dock. The Rivers and Harbors Act of 1898 required permission or permits for building any encroachment into the waterways and for dumping any materials into the water. The only federal institution prepared to handle this influx of permitting paperwork and certified to overview plans and technical documents for new docks was the U.S. Army Engineering Battalion. To this day, the Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for permitting encroachments, seawalls, riprap, rock banks, and pipes into the water that collect water or discharge pollution. The second precedent goes back even farther. In 533 AD, old Roman law was compiled and written down, carved in stone actually, all in one place. This ancient Roman legal framework is called the Institutes of Justinian and is a foundation for both European and British law. An important part of the Institutes of Justinian is the codification that the bed and banks of major rivers and of the seashore are publicly accessible. Running water was not to be owned, like the air, and the sea, etc., but instead to be common to all, that the common person could have access to the bed and banks of the river, ensured that people could fish for food, row a boat past private property, and access this important resource. To this day, most states in the U.S retain the submerged land under navigable waterways and therefore allow fishing and other recreation activities, including incidental contact with the bed and banks of the river. Private property generally starts at the ordinary high water mark, which has a strict le legal definition that we will discuss in the habitat assessment module. But anyone can camp on sandbars below that high water mark or pull their canoes up to shore and fish the navigable rivers and streams. Some states did give up the bed and banks of the rivers to private property, so there are some exceptions. Colorado is one such state. Idaho law is very clear that the bed and banks of navigable rivers are held by the state or by the Indian tribes in the public interest. The Clean Water Act designates a list of beneficial uses that surface water bodies provide to us. These beneficial uses include aquatic life, water supply, recreation, wildlife habitats, and aesthetics. In their natural state, streams and lakes provide some of these beneficial uses to us unimpeded by pollution. Naturally, warm water streams will support, for example, warm water aquatic life like catfish and bass, while cold mountain streams will support cold water aquatic life like trout and salmon. But an excess of pollution can be an impairment to a water body being able to provide those beneficial uses. You can imagine how difficult it is to manage for all the beneficial uses attributed to a stream compared to if only one had to manage for one of them. The Clean Water Act provides a framework that scientists can use to determine how much pollution a water body can accept before beneficial uses are impaired. There is also a process for developing solutions. The framework and solutions are sort of like a doctor's prescription. That is, if people follow the prescription for cleaning up the waterway, the water quality will improve. Of course, one can always ignore a doctor's prescription, but that won't make you healthier. These prescriptions are called Total Maximum Daily Loads, or TMDLs. They are technical documents that outline how the impairment happens lists where the sources of pollution are, and explains scientific methods for ensuring data quality. In Idaho, the Department of Environmental Quality hires scientists to write these TMDLs in an effort to improve water quality. DEQ has a good website that describes TMDLs and beneficial uses in more detail. You can find that web link on the screen here, and also in the list of links in the online class platform. To make the process more efficient, 
TMDLs are written to protect the most difficult to achieve beneficial use. That is, while irrigation water is an important beneficial use, cold water aquatic life is often most easily impacted by pollution, and so the TMDL will be written to address the pollutants that affect that. Pollution is a change in the biological, physical, and or chemical properties of water that is harmful to humans or aquatic life. Pollution can come from two broad sources. The easiest to describe is point source pollution. This describes discharges of substances from a single identifiable source, like an outfall pipe. The 1972 Clean Water Act did a good job of reducing and eliminating most of the point sources of pollution by enforcing clean water standards and by providing funding for wastewater plants and industries to develop better pollution control techniques. Point source discharges were fairly quickly reduced and the rivers in the U.S. no longer caught fire and some began supporting fisheries within the next 10 years. However, improvements to our nation's water bodies plateaued by the early 1980s. The Clean Water Act was written primarily to focus on point sources of pollution. It did not adequately address the other broad pollution source called non-point source pollution. Non-point source pollution emerges from a broad variety of places across the landscape, from a few drops of oil on a parking lot, from a leaky car, to the rubber dust from tire wear, to excess fertilizers running off of a lawn, to soil erosion from a poorly managed construction project. Non-point source pollution is like the old phrase, a death by a thousand cuts. While no single incident of pollution being released into the water might cause a problem, the accumulated effect of countless bits of pollution across the landscape, all washing into the stream, concentrates the impairment to a stream's beneficial uses. The 1987 amendments to the Clean Water Act provided a separate regulatory and funding mechanism to try to tackle the vexing problem of non-point source pollution. Regulations focused on enforcing the implementation of best management practices, like sediment control measures and secondary containment for chemical storage tanks. Funding focuses on helping communities to pay for investments in pollution solutions and BMP installations. This funding is handed to states to competitively fund projects through grants via Section 319 of the Clean Water Act. You might hear about a, a quote, 319 pollution control project, unquote. This refers to the fact that the funding originated with the Clean Water Act. Projects are proposed to Idaho Basin Advisory Groups, which are groups of stakeholders from a wide swath of the community who make decisions about how to best spend these grant funds. Now that we know where the pollution comes from, let's take a look at the most common types of pollution found in Idaho's waterways. The top three are sediment, nutrients, and temperature. Sediments in the water come from erosion and can be fine particles like sand, silt, and clay, or they can be coarser materials like rocks in the bottom of the stream. Fine sediments are bad for the fish. It clogs their gills and smothers their eggs when it deposits on top of the gravels the eggs are located. Fine sediments are also a source of nutrients like phosphorus. Sediments can also contain heavy metals like lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Coarse sediments are rolled along the bottom of the stream and are also caused by erosion. A stream that is in balance is able to carry along all of the materials that are naturally eroded away each year. Streams experiencing high erosion will become overloaded by both types of sediments. These sediments, especially coarse sediments, build up in the stream bottoms, causing a phenomenon called aggradation. When a stream aggrades, the sediments continue to build up, raising the elevation of the stream bottom. This forces the stream to get wider, causing additional bank erosion. Some streams become wide and shallow, and sometimes even go dry when the water flow disappears within the interstitial spaces amongst the rocks and sediment, sometimes referred to as going subsurface. A stream in this condition needs to have the problem fixed through stream bank restoration or road and culvert repair or decommission. Then the stream needs time to flush out all the accumulated sediment over years and even decades. The bottom center photo slide here, this one, shows the Coeur d'Alene River entering the lake at Harrison 
during a high water event in 1996. It's carrying a plume of sediments that are heavily contaminated with metals. Now nutrients are fertilizers and can come from a lot of watershed activities. The two primary nutrients of concern in the water are phosphorus and nitrates. Phosphorus is derived from rock and soil. It's a mineral that promotes plant root and stem growth. It tends to bind to soil and only some types are highly soluble. Phosphorus does not break down but instead tends to accumulate in the sediments at the bottom of lakes. Therefore a lake can recycle its phosphorus over and over again under the right conditions. Phosphorus concentrations in Idaho streams should be very low in the order of four parts per billion or micrograms per liter. The larger rivers or any stream with a heavy sediment load can have much higher concentrations. Small increases in available phosphorus can cause big changes in nuisance plant growth and cyan cyanobacteria blooms in lakes. Cyanobacteria used to be referred to as blue-green algae, but they are really a photosynthesizing bacteria. Some species can generate cyanotoxins that are potent enough to sicken or even kill animals and even humans. Some are hepatotoxins. Those affect the liver and internal organ organs. And others are neurotoxins, affecting the nervous system. The photo on the bottom right, this one, shows Fernand Lake, just outside of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, during a cyanobacteria bloom. You should never swim or allow pets to swim or drink from the water with a cyanobacteria bloom. Fishing can be safe, just wash your hands. Eating the fish is safe as long as the fatty portions of the fish are discarded. Ida H2O partners with NOAA's Phytoplankton Monitoring Network, another citizen science program, to help monitor lakes and estuaries for emerging cyanobacteria and red tide blooms. More information about that program can be found at a link provided in the learning platform. Or you can just Google NOAA Phytoplankton Monitoring Network. Nitrates are another nutrient that promotes leafy plant growth. Nitrates are derived from atmospheric nitrogen and added to fertilizer. Nitrates are more of a problem with groundwater and wells than with surface water. Nitrates are highly soluble and leach into the groundwater. Consuming water with concentrations of nitrate higher than 10 parts per million or milligrams per liter can cause human health problems like blue baby syndrome. This is a condition that has mostly been solved in Western countries, as people with high nitrate well water have access to bottled water to drink. In brief, nitrates bind to red blood cells better than oxygen does. It's a lot like carbon monoxide poisoning in this way. This can cause apnea, and newborns and the very elderly are particularly at risk. Babies were born with a bluish tint since their blood was lacking in oxygen. It's not always fatal, and in fact, one of my colleagues' father was a blue baby. Long-term exposure to nitrates in drinking water has been linked to some types of cancer, too. Other nitrogen-based nutrients include ammonia and nitrites. These, too, can cause undesirable plant growth, but are not a strong promoter for cyanobacteria blooms. Increases in all nutrients can cause rapid plant growth called a bloom. When the nutrients are exhausted at the end of the bloom, the plants, including single-celled algae, die off and float down to the bottom of lakes or rivers. Bacteria there naturally break down and consume these dead plant materials. This process consumes dissolved oxygen and can result in extremely low dissolved oxygen concentrations, or anoxia, in lake water. An interesting phenomenon with nutrients is that a natural balance of phosphorus and nitrates is expressed as a ratio of anywhere from 1 to 7 to 1 to 70 phosphorus to nitrogen. Okay, that's a wide range, and it's still under a lot of research. But you can think of nitrates as like salad, and phosphorus is, well, donuts. So think of it like this. If you eat a whole lot of salad and very few donuts, you'll probably be pretty healthy. If you increase the donuts to salad ratio, your metabolism will suffer. <laughs> when that phosphorus to nitrogen ratio changes in lakes, the cyanobacteria blooms tend to appear. Nitrates are actually added to some lakes, especially in the Midwest, but also here in Dvorak Reservoir near Orofino, Idaho, to keep the lake's metabolism in better balance. At Dvorak, 
The Army Corps of Engineers tests the lake water on Tuesdays to determine how much excess phosphorus is present. By Thursday, a boat is adding nitrate at the correct rate to bring the phosphorus nitrogen ratio back to a healthy level. Real world field research has demonstrated how this works. With sufficient nitrates in the water, the regular old green algae, phytoplankton, can compete well with the cyanobacteria. The algae is the primary food source for the zooplankton. These are tiny animals that zip around in the water column and which in turn feed the small fish, which in turn feed the big fish, which in turn feed the eagles and the osprey and, well, us too. So a system in balance doesn't turn all green and scummy and gross, like that bottom right photo I showed you a moment ago. Here, this one. If the phosphorus to nitrogen ratio remains too high, the green algae population is outcompeted by the cyanobacteria, leaving less food available for zooplankton. Many cyanobacteria are nitrogen fixers. They can chemically turn atmospheric nitrogen into nitrates, much like legumes do with their root nodes. Regular green algae cannot fix nitrogen in this way. Therefore, cyanobacteria have an advantage when phosphorus concentrations increase, they can outcompete the run of the mill green algae. Zooplankton don't eat the cyanobacteria as readily. This, in turn, reduces the food available for the small fish who eat the zooplankton, while the cyanobacteria thrive and blooms and cause problems. Remember, too, that not all sediments and nutrients are pollutants. Streams naturally move sediments around. It's only a problem when there's too much sediment in the system. Each ecosystem is unique based on its abiotic and biotic characteristics. Natural ecosystems need some nutrients to drive the food web. Cold water aquatic life is especially affected by increases in water temperature. Thermal pollution affects organisms' metabolism. It also affects the water's ability to carry dissolved oxygen. The higher the water temperature, the less oxygen is physically able to dissolve in the water. This is the opposite of dissolved solids, where warmer water can carry higher concentrations of dissolved solids. Our waterways have been warming significantly over the last century for several reasons. First is that we build cities with parking lots and roads and rooftops, all of which absorb heat. The heat is carried off in stormwater to the streams. But even in rural areas, we have lost the brushy, almost impenetrable riparian shrubs and trees that naturally line our waterways. These are called riparian buffer zones, and they moderate the water temperature in two ways. First, they provide shade. Now, this doesn't actually cool the water, but it actually helps to keep the water from getting warmer on hot, sunny days. Secondly, they do act sort of like a swamp cooler by providing evaporative cooling. Plants take up water that is transpired or evaporated from their leaves. This process provides a small amount of actual cooling for the area immediately adjacent to the stream. But many people like their direct views of the stream and lake and have a tendency to cut down the riparian zones. Protecting or reestablishing riparian zones can solve both erosion and temperature pollution problems. There is also a direct connection between water quantity and thermal quality. Streams may develop water temperature problems from reductions in the flow caused by irrigation withdrawal, incised streams that drain adjacent groundwater, and reduced groundwater inflow by wells, or lack of wet season recharge. Some temperature problems can be corrected through practices that increase flow. Larger lakes undergo a phenomenon called stratification. In the summer, the surface water absorbs sunlight and warms up more than the water at depth. This warmer water is less dense and literally floats above the colder water below. You may have experienced this while swimming in a lake. Stick your foot way down or swim down maybe 10 feet or so and you will feel a rather sudden drop in temperature. The layer of warm surface water called the epilimnion, epi means surface and limnion refers to the lake, will persist all summer because it's so much less dense than the cold water below. You will find warm water fish like bass living here. It effectively cuts the bottom water, or hypolimnion, off from the atmosphere. Cold water fish like trout will find a refuge from the lethally hot surface water. 
but they can also suffer from low dissolved oxygen concentrations. If a lot of plant life blooms at the surface and then dies and then decomposes at the bottom. Hopefully the trout can hang on until colder weather conditions in the fall is able to cool that surface water to equal the bottom water. This results in fall phenomenon called turnover. All the nutrient rich but oxygen poor bottom water suddenly mixes with the nutrient poor and oxygen rich surface water. The cold water fish get a welcome reprieve from low oxygen concentrations and lots more habitat to work with. Now Idaho has other pollution problems too. In some areas with historic mining activities, metals like lead, arsenic, cadmium, and nine others contaminate soils and sediments. Most heavy metals are not very soluble in water and are also physically heavy and so tend to stay locked in the sediments. But anoxic conditions with dissolved oxygen below about two parts per million milligrams per liter can enable redox reactions to mobilize metals in the sediment and increase their solubility. Reduction oxidation chemistry is very complex, but the phenomenon of metals dissolving out of lake sediments and into the water column and then redepositing as a distinct layer on top of the sediments has been photo documented at the bottom of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Petroleum products and persistent organic compounds like DDT and PCBs are concerning in some areas. Bacteria like E. coli can become a problem in some swimming areas with an overabundance of geese or bad septic tanks, things like that. The complex interconnections among the various pollutants, dissolved nutrients, hypolimnetic dissolved oxygen concentrations, fish habitat, and other factors are too much to fully cover in this workshop but lots, lots of research reports are available and I'm happy to discuss those in more detail or to connect you with scientists who study these things. Okay, get ready for your next quiz. This concludes module two. We'll see you at the beginning of module three, which will help you get started as a new master water steward.